Welcome to the fifth webinar in the Water in the Native World webinar series. My name is Dr. Carletta Chief, and I'm an Associate Professor and Extension Specialist in the Environmental Science Department at the University of Arizona. As an Extension Specialist, I work to bring relevant science to Native American communities in a culturally sensitive manner by providing hydrology expertise and working with the communities to, uh, to identify research questions. This webinar series features papers in a special issue in which I was the guest editor called Water in the Native World. Papers were about water challenges facing tribes where indigenous scientists and community members and students led the projects and led in addressing the challenges facing the communities. You can download the special issue at ucalwar.org. This work was also supported by three federal grants. The first one is NSF grant, Water in the Native World. The second one is a USDA grant entitled Enhancing Climate Resiliency and Agricultural on American Indian Land. The third grant is the University of Arizona NIEHS Superfund Research Program, Risk and Remediation of Metal Mighty Waste. Today's seminar is entitled Unregulated and Emerging Contaminants in Tribal Water by Dr. Otakuye Conroy Ben from Arizona State University. I would like to introduce Dr. Otakuye Conroy Ben. Dr. Conroy Ben is Oglala Lakota and originally from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. She's a first generation college student and she went on to receive a bachelor's in chemistry from the University of Notre Dame and also a master's in chemistry, a master's in environmental engineering as well. She received her PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Arizona. Her postdoctoral co-appointments co were in biochemistry and environmental science, also from the University of Arizona. Dr. Conroy Ben previously served in the role uh, as secretary on the board of directors for the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. She was also a recipient of the ACES Professional Award for Technical Excellence. Her professional appointments include a research engineering staff for the Los Angeles County Sanitation District and a faculty member at the University of Utah. She's currently assistant professor in environmental engineering at Arizona State University, where she does research on endocrine disruptors, antimicrobial resistance, wastewater engineering, and water quality disparities. Please visit the webinar website for previous recordings for our other speakers from the papers that were published. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Atakuye Conroy Ben. Thank you, Carletta. Um, the title of my paper that I submitted to the special issue in the Journal of Contemporary Water Research and Education is Unregulated and Emerging Contaminants in Tribal Water, uh, a uh, reviewed uh, unregulated contaminants from an EPA database. This is a secondary data analysis, uh, along with my master's student, Emily Crowder. Uh, Emily uh, is a master's um, student in civil environmental and sustainable engineering at Arizona State University. She received a bachelor's in civil engineering from the University of New Mexico. Okay, this is an overview of the talk. Uh, I'd like to go over some of the classes of emerging contaminants as it relates to what has been uh, monitored in tribal communities, as well as some of my previous work. And then uh, I will present some previous work on emerging contaminant research in tribal communities. I'll then discuss the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. And then we'll look at the data from the survey in tri tribal public water systems. 
So a vast array of pharmaceuticals, including antibiotics, anticonvulsants, mood stabilizers, and sex hormones have been found in the drinking water supplies of at least 41 million Americans. This was reported by the Associated Press in 2008. Uh, I think that the population that is that these contaminants are reaching is much larger than that, um, especially with these new uh, monitoring surveys. Uh, so what are these emerging contaminants? Well, emerging contaminants are called emerging because there's still a significant amount of testing going on uh, with regards to the prevalence in water and their biological impacts as well as environmental impacts. These are unregulated. Examples of emerging contaminants are the nonstick coating chemicals found on your uh, cooking pans. The structure up here is 17 beta estradiol, which is a female hormone. What you see in this black inset box are uh, plastic particles. And last year it was reported that um, these microplastics were found in nearly all of our drinking water supplies. You'll find um, pharmaceuticals over the counters present in water and wastewater, as well as caffeine, uh, bisphenol products. Uh, we have tried to move from bisphenol plastics to BPA free, as well as antibiotics. Additional classes of emerging contaminants. Uh, I mentioned the endocrine disruptors, so the human hormones, hormone mimics, synthetic hormones, biocides, including herbicides, insecticides, pesticides, nanomaterials, nanoparticles, nanotubes, consumer products, so uh, chemicals in your fragrances, soaps, insect repellents, illegal drugs, such as the um, Amphetamines, opioids, cannabinoids, uh, microplastics, flame retardants, as well as pharmaceuticals. And there are um, other classes of emerging contaminants, and we'll discuss those as they appear in this talk. So I have been researching emerging contaminants for 20 years now. And it started when I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona in the lab of Dr. Bob Arnold where uh, we were starting to notice in literature that um, there was this phenomenon going on in wildlife called endocrine disruption. And what is this? Well, uh, the hormonal system in animals was being disrupted by pollution. And this was really impacting animals that were uh, constantly exposed to water, such as aquatic animals or in polar bears as the news clip shows up there. What we're seeing is that um, our hormone system is in a delicate balance. And if you're introducing um, pollutants that can mimic these hormones, then we're seeing um, physiological effects such as intersex in fish, where we're seeing both male and female sex characteristics. Um, this was a well uh, noted study in 2007 uh, by Kidd. Um, where she applied, um, or I guess her research team applied um, EE2, which is 17-alpha uh, ethanol estradiol, uh, to a freshwater lake um, in a controlled environment um, in uh, relevant environmental concentrations, which tend to be pretty low. Um, what was observed was that after several generations, uh, after several years, the fish population was wiped out. Uh, and in this manner, um, it was hypothesized that this EE2 was uh, just shifting the, um, uh, uh, impacting the um, sex characteristics of the fish so that they could no longer reproduce. So um, starting at the University of Arizona, I focused on endocrine disrupting chemicals, specifically estrogenic and androgenic chemicals. And one of the major uh, research studies conducted uh, uh, collaboratively with other uh, faculty on campus was the analysis of the Santa Cruz River, which flows from uh, 
north to or from south to a northwest along I-10. And along this river are, or I should say were, uh, two large wastewater treatment facilities, the Rod Road Wastewater Treatment Plant, located here at the bottom. And then several miles up the road was the Ina Road Wastewater Treatment Plant. Aside from uh, the summer, which receives uh, monsoon storms, this river is essentially 100% wastewater. So what we wanted to see was, uh, could we measure these hormones in the wastewater? And we, wanted, we were focusing on wastewater because uh, we excrete these hormones in our waste and wastewater treatment facilities are not designed to remove uh, these micropollutants. Also, uh, there is an aquifer underlying the river, and we wanted to see if the wastewater was infiltrating into uh, the subsurface and mixing with the groundwater. So what we measured was the estrogen hormone concentration, and that is your y-axis on the left, measured as E2 equivalents or 17 beta estradiol equivalents. There was another graduate student who was also measuring wastewater content uh, of polluted water. And you can do this by measuring the boron 11 to boron 10 ratio. And that is conserved in wastewater. It arises from um, soaps and detergents. And so what we found is when we collect, after we collected the well water from um, the length of the Santa Cruz River, what we found was that the wells lay, uh, lying in the vicinity of wastewater treatment plants, the groundwater, was 100% wastewater. And that's indicated by these blue diamonds at the top of the graph. And aside from this first well, SC1, the other two wells with 100% wastewater also had high signatures of human hormones. So we got an indication that this wastewater is infiltrating into the ground, it is present, and it does have some biological signature. If you're interested in this paper, uh, please refer to Quant Dave Quanrud. Uh, he was the lead author in this work. Um, I measured the hormone concentrations and the other graduate student measured boron isotope ratios. So related to that work, um, I like to look at these emerging contaminants to see what is their biological signature. So this paper was published a couple years ago where we looked at bisphenol A as well as the bisphenol replacements. Uh, and we measured the estrogenic activity of these chemicals as well as the androgenic uh, activity. And we um, surveyed a whole suite of bisphenols, BPA, as well as BPS, um, which tends to be the plasticizer used to replace BPA. And uh, what we found, I won't uh, labor you with the um, technical details of that plot was that we saw a trend in the estrogenic activity of these bisphenol replacements where the more complex, larger structure um, of the bisphenol, the more estrogenic it is. And it was even more estrogenic than the human est uh, estrogen 17 beta estradiol. What we also found, which was quite alarming, was that these bisphenol replacements are anti-androgens. So that means they can go in and um, disrupt the uh, male signaling um, pathway in their, um, as they, as these animals um, mature um, uh, reproductively. So these chemicals were estrogens as well as anti-androgens. So in my lab, what I do is I measure these water samples, I measure specific chemicals, and I look for endocrine disrupting activity. So has this been done in tribal lands? There are a couple of studies, published reports, um, projects conducted by the US Geological Survey. 
uh, in this report here, um, they partnered with the Stelaguamish tribe in Washington State, where they measured um, contaminants of emerging concern in a river basin. A similar work was done uh, also by USGS along the um, Missouri River in North Dakota, where they were looking for human hormones, pharmaceuticals, and wastewater indicators. Uh, this river tends to um, be a little bit more freshwater, um, but it, uh, I, I can imagine it is impacted by wastewater. The water was positive for sulfamethoxazole as well as other wastewater indicator contaminants. Aside from those two studies, uh, there have not, I have not seen any other published um, reports on emerging contaminants in tribal water. Uh, locally in Arizona, uh, there, there is the issue of wastewater reclamation. Uh, my previous work did show that there are estrogens, hormones. Uh, the USG, USGS work showed that there are, are pharmaceuticals in reclaimed wastewater. And the issue that's going on at Snowball near uh, Flagstaff is that um, they are currently using reclaimed wastewater as a snowmaking source. Um, there are many um, issues associated with this, not only scientifically, but with regards to environmental justice, because these are sacred mountains. Um, it's one of the four sacred mountains uh, for the Navajo, and it's traditional to many other southwestern tribes. So uh, for um, this work, I had the opportunity to uh, analyze the environmental impact statement uh, when I was an intern at National Congress of American Indians. And many of the contaminants were found below method detection limits. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, these contaminants um, are not there. Um, we just need to um, look at the analytical methods. But when you look at a survey of Arizona surface water, which can contain reclaimed wastewater, um, we are finding signatures of pharmaceuticals um, as well as human hormones. Okay, so moving on to the um, body of work, um, which is the topic of this presentation, is the unregulated contaminants monitoring rule which many of these contaminants I have presented thus far uh, fall under. These are contaminants um, which are definitely found in wastewater, um, but are they found in drinking water? And so the US EPA is monitoring approximately 30 unregulated contaminants every five years. Uh, these are unregulated. Um, EPA wants to see how um, Populous, these chemicals are nationwide, at what concentrations, and are the concentrations present at, at a level that should be alarming? Um, this is simply a survey. Um, these are not regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act yet, but it will give an indication of um, what will happen if um, these were to become regulated in the future. So to date, there uh, are four UCMR campaigns. The first UCMR, UCMR1, uh, looked for insecticides, herbicides, oxygenates, combustion products, and organic precursors. About five years later, so that was early 2000s, about five years later was UCMR2. Uh, here, uh, EPA was looking for insecticides, brominated flame retardants, explosives, acid analids, and nitrosamines. Okay, in UCMR3, um, I'll just highlight that uh, some of the chemicals analyzed were for semi-volatiles, synthetic organics, um, purpurea chemicals, and hormones. Currently, UCMR4 is underway. I don't have uh, much data for this set. Um, but EPA is looking for cyanotoxins, metals, pesticides, um, brominated, uh, haloacetic acids, um, and others listed here. 
This uh, report is a secondary data analysis. So what we did is we downloaded the EPA data spreadsheets and we extracted out all of the tribal data. And then we also de-identified the specific water treatment utility and generalized it um, as a tribal uh, utility. We um, also did not include uh, the dates um, or the sampling points. But if you wish to look specifically at this data, I can provide it to you or you could download it on epa.gov. We um, collected all of the concentration data as well as the tribal data. Uh, for data reporting, the public water system uh, for drinking water uh, was classified based off of their size meaning how many customers does this um, water system serve. So a very small public water system is 25 to 500 customers. Small is about 500 to 3,300, medium up to 10,000, and then large and very large greater than 10,000 customers. In this talk, I will be referring to the method detection limit. Okay, and that is the lowest concentration that can be detected by the EPA method. Also, um, I will also refer to the health reference limit, and that is uh, some type of reference concentration similar to a, an MCL or a maximum contaminant limit for the Safe Drinking Water Act contaminants. This is a limit that has been well studied. Um, it is, gives an indication of a cautionary concentration um, that should not be exceeded. Again, these are not yet regulated, um, so it's not necessarily enforceable to fall below this health reference limit. At the time we analyzed this data, there were over 1,000 tri uh, tribal public water systems, and that information was obtained from the ECHO database, which is the Enforcement Compliance History Online. Let's look at the specifics of each of these UCMR campaigns. Okay, so US UCMR 1 sampling and analysis occurred between 2001 and 2005. The top table shows you the class of chemicals, which I generalized a few slides ago. And you can see the specific chemicals that were analyzed in the water samples. Some of these campaigns have different listed chemicals. Uh, for example, uh, for list one, um, for this, uh, we're targeting um, herbicides, the organic precursors, oxygen additives, and list two will target a different set of chemicals. Now when tribes um, either analyze their own samples or send them out, they don't necessarily have to analyze for both list one and two, they may just select list one or list two or both. So this was in the development stages in the early 2000s, so there was not much tribal participation when it came to sample analysis. There, was, there were six tribes um, who uh, had their water sampled. Um, and these were small public drinking water facilities. Four had groundwater sources as their drinking water source and two had surface water sources. Uh, as um, EPA met uh, with tribes, uh, got comments back, had a period of tribal consultation, uh, more uh, drinking water facilities were included in the uh, subsequent campaigns. So you can see with UCMR2, the diversity of the public water size, the tribe, um, as well as the drinking water sources increased. The contaminants analyzed um, during this period of 2007 to 2011 include the explosives, 
the brominated flame retardants, the uh, brominated diphenyl ethers, and insecticides under list one. And then under list two were the acid analids as well as nitrosamines. Nitrosamines are disinfection byproducts. And you can see further that um, more and more tribes are being included in this unregulated contaminant monitoring for UCMR3, uh, which uh, occurred during 2012 to 2016. Uh, there were a number of small public water facilities with groundwater sources and surface water sources, uh, as well as some large drinking water facilities. List one of UCMR3 included the metals, the oxyhalide anion chlorate, the perfluorinated chemicals, synthetic organics, as well as VOCs, which are volatile organic chemicals. List two only included the hormones, uh, so that's my area of research, the male and female hormones, and list three introduced uh, some non-chemical um, pollutants, which are viruses, the enteroviruses, as well as noroviruses. Okay, and so what were the results? Well, I first wanted to see uh, what did the tribal public water systems analyze for? So on your y-axis is the number of reporting facilities, tribal public water systems, I should say, actually facilities. And uh, this goes back to my previous comment uh, where uh, some of these tribes opted to only um, test their water for certain lists within the UCMR campaign. Okay, so you see uh, there were only uh, six tribes that participated in UCMR1. Okay. Under UCMR2, the focus for the analysis was on uh, explosives, flame retardants, as well as insecticides. Under UCMR3, which is the most com recent complete data set, uh, most tribes opted to analyze for metals as well as oxyhalide anions and they opted to not analyze um, at the low end of analysis, I should say, uh, was the hormones. I'll talk a little bit about UCMR4 at the end of my talk. Um, again, we don't have that complete data set yet. Okay, so this table here summarizes um, UCMR3. Um, I only, I'm only showing UCMR3 because under UCMR1 and UCMR2, all tribal public water samples, uh, the concentrations were less than the method detection limit. Uh, so there's basically uh, no data to report there. But we did see um, a number of reported values under UCMR3. And so let's look closer at this plot. So all of the UCMR3 contaminants are listed on your y-axis. And under UCMR3, there were 30 different tribal public water systems that were analyzed. Only seven public water systems opted to analyze for the hormones. And uh, if you look at the color coding, um, the gray bars indicate that the concentration fell less than the method detection limit. So essentially, in these uh, seven tribal public water systems, no hormones were detected. The, uh, I, I should say 22, 23 of the tribal public water systems opted to test for the remaining contaminants. So what are these contaminants? You have a number of halogenated organics. Halogenated organics tend to um, show uh, indications of carcin uh, carcinogenicity. Also analyzed were the perfluorinated chemicals, uh, as well as heavy metals, uh, solvent, 1,4-dioxine, as well as um, chlorate, a disinfection byproduct. 
the yellow bar shows that the water sample was greater than the method detection limit. And if you see red, that means the water samples or the public water the sampling of the public water systems exceeded the recommended health limit. So there are a number of contaminants on here which uh, does raise some alarm. Uh, for example, we're seeing perfluorinated chemicals in a tribal community. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, dioxane is exceeding a recommended health limit in um, one of the tribal communities. We're seeing a significant amount of heavy metals, vanadium, strontium, molybdenum, chromium. And in some cases, the health recommendation limit was exceeded. And finally, we're seeing a significant amount of chlorate in our public water systems. Okay, so what I want to uh, do next is show you the specific um, concentration span that we saw in this data set. And we'll focus on the chemicals um, that were highlighted by the red bars. Okay, the first is 1,4-dioxane, which is a heterocycle. This is a common industrial solvent used to stabilize chlorinated solvents, and it's often found in groundwater um, contaminated with chlorinated solvents. And it can be found um, just as a byproduct in other um, applications. For uh, this chemical, it uh, appeared in uh, five different public uh, tribal public water systems. The recommended health limit is 0.35 to 35 micrograms per liter. Uh, this is pretty small. We're talking uh, part per billion level. And this was the span of the concentration. So obviously this red bar is indicated by the recommended health limit. And anything above that shows you samples that exceeded that concentration. And anything below um, means we did detect dioxane, uh, or dioxane was detected in the public water system, but it did not reach that recommended health limit. 1,4-dioxane uh, is a known carcinogen. Okay, the perfluorinated chemicals are also known as the forever chemical. This, this class of chemicals is highly resistant to biodegradation as well as degradation in general and it's being found uh, increasingly in drinking water. The contaminants of concern under this class of chemicals are PFOA, uh, perfluorooctanoate. This is a surfactant used in chemical processes, as well as PFOS. Uh, you may have heard of both of these um, in the area of environmental science. PFAS is used in firefighting foams, um, and both of these are considered to be um, flame retardants. Okay, they are forever chemicals. They will bioaccumulate into lipids uh, to toxic levels in mammals. Structurally, this is what they look like. Uh, it's a long chain uh, uh, hydrocarbon where the hydrogens are substituted with fluorine. Uh, and then uh, at the terminal end of one or both ends are uh, some functional groups where you can have uh, a carboxylic acid, uh, which would be the case for PFOA. Um, you can have alcohols. And you can have, not shown here, um, sulfonates. So um, we did see a signature for um, these perfluoral chemicals. PFOS and PFOA were found in one tribal public water system located near a major metropolitan area. Okay, the next series of chemicals are metals that were on the UCMR3 list. Um, first being strontium. Strontium is naturally occurring at low levels in surface and groundwater. Uh, with chronic expo exposure, uh, you can have adverse effects in bone density and de uh, dental development. The um, health recommendation limit for strontium uh, is high. It's 1.5 milligram per liter. 
and there were uh, four um, public water systems that exceeded uh, that level uh, for strontium. Vanadium is naturally occurring. Uh, it is somewhat rare, used in steel alloys and batteries, and it is a possible, possible carcinogen. Okay, vanadium has a recommended health limit of 21 micrograms per liter. And uh, there were a number of facilities that exceeded the HRL for vanadium. Chromium uh, exists as several oxidation states. Chromium-6 is the more toxic form, whereas chromium-3 is non-toxic and it can actually be beneficial in low doses. And so for UCMR3, um, both chromium-6 as well as total chromium were assessed in public water systems. Um, I actually put up the wrong plot, I apologize for that. Um, I will find that plot later, or you could refer to the paper. Um, but for chromium, um, a number of public water systems did, did exceed the recommended health limit for uh, chromium-6. Excuse me, uh, just um, chromium has a maximum contaminant level. It does, yes. Yes, but not chromium-6. Yes. So, in here... Uh, and also, also you're, you're using the term max or health level and limit inter interchangeably? So, yeah, so it's HRL, health reference. But, but what is the term? Is it limit or level? Health, health is a level. Level? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so yes, yeah, so chromium-6 as well as total chromium was uh, monitored here. And then for chlorate, chlorate is uh, a highly oxidized uh, oxy anion of chlorine uh, with a plus five oxidation state. It is a byproduct of drinking water disinfection. A uh, long-term intake can lead to health problems um, affecting the thyroid. So for chlorate, the recommended health limit is, health level, sorry, is, um, 250 micrograms per liter. And again, uh, a number of tribal public water systems exceeded this, um, but uh, a significant um, uh, amount more did not, uh, it fell less than the recommended health level. level. Uh, molybdenum was also a heavy metal that was monitored. Um, the highest concentrations are near mining sites and it's used in the production of various metals. Uh, it can replace chromium-6 in some processes. It is naturally occurring in food and drinking water and um, it is uh, an essential micronutrient for human diet, diets. <coughs> Um, the EPA had not set an HRL for molybdenum, so um, in this plot I'm just showing the span from the highest to lowest um, that were observed in tribal drinking water systems. Okay, um, so those were the major contaminants that uh, kind of got my interest in this survey. Um, so in summary, this was a secondary data analysis of the UCMR campaigns. The sample concentrations were less than the met method detection limits for UCMR1 and UCMR2. And uh, what we found under UCMR3 were that there were some contaminants that we should pay attention to, including dioxane, PFOS, strontium, vanadium, chromium, chlorate, and molybdenum. They were measured in tribal drinking water uh, above the method detection limit, and in some cases exceeding the health recommendation level. So um, at the time we were pulling all of this data, um, some tribes were reporting uh, UCMR4 concentrations. Um, so under UCMR4, um, what was being reported were the haloacetic acids, which are disinfection byproducts, germanium as well as manganese, 
and all of these classes of chemicals uh, fell below the HRLs, but above the method detection limit. Um, this is expected to wrap up in 2021, 2022. And so um, as that data gets completed, um, I'd be interested in looking back at uh, what this data set tells us. Okay, um, so related to these emerging contaminants on the research side, um, I do this type of work in my lab. Uh, one thing we're looking at are these, you know, pharmaceuticals, these drugs of abuse in wastewater as it pertains to human health. So we're looking at wastewater-based epidemiology in tribal communities. Um, also an interest of mine uh, is the antibiotic resistance. We're measuring antibiotic resistant genes in wastewater, wastewater efflu effluent, and wastewater impacted water. And then um, along the themes of endocrine disruption, uh, we're branching into metabolic disruption where we're looking for an environmental basis for um, adiposity, diabetes, as well as hypertension and other uh, metabolic disruptive, um, disrupting activity. And this is just some data that we recently um, acquired where it shows that exposing zebrafish to something like BPA um, at one micromolar um, increases their fat content. And, and this has been observed with other chemicals as well. So thank you in Lakota, that's Pilamaya. Um, I have a number of students who work on all the different aspects of emerging contaminants in my lab, and they are listed here. Funding for this talk specifically came from USDA NEFA um, under a non-land grant um, award. Uh, listed are my PIs, uh, co-PIs, Dr. Rebecca Munich, Clinton Williams from USDA, and our uh, community college partner. I'd also like to thank Carletta for inviting me to um, write a paper, not only in your in the current um, special issue, but in the first special issue. I'd also like to thank the University, University Council on Water Resources and their journal, um, JCWRE, for uh, allowing Carletta to do these special issues. I don't know that our work would uh, be highlighted in this fashion um, without their support. And now, um, I guess we'll open it up for discussion. We have about 15 minutes left. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Karoy Ben, for your presentation today. And yes, we'd like to uh, get some questions now. If you could just unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat box, that would be great. Thank you. I have a question. Hello? Yes, we hear you. Go oh, ahead, okay. Mark. Yeah, um, I had a question. What do you see your future um, research work now that after you finish with this grant, what else do you expand upon your particular research? Dr. Dr. Bien. Sure. Um, so I am actually a wastewater engineer, uh, okay. not really in the drinking water field. So I'm looking at the impacts of reusing wastewater as a water source, looking at all the different health aspects and risk associated with that. Okay. Okay. Do you work a lot with the state of Arizona's um, Department of Environmental uh, Quality? I don't. No. Okay. All right. I have a question from Judy Zylikoff. She asked the question, where do we go from here regarding policy and intervention strategies? So um, regarding policy, um, it's going to be up to EPA to formally introduce these as Safe Drinking Water Act contaminants. Um, or the state can step in and do that as well. 
Now, um, I know that the, some of these contaminants are a concern presently. Uh, for example, um, when you're looking at maybe using some resin to pull out um, uranium. Uh, these competing uh, heavy metals, or, or I should say these heavy metals are competing for those sites. Um, so vanadium is a problem. Um, and so um, it's gonna take some federal level policy um, to really implement that. Um, as far as intervention, um, I mean, these are emerging contaminants. If we're seeing um, something like PFAS, we're most likely seeing other contaminants that are regulated. Um, and so, um, you know, it's up to the water utility to um, really step in and maybe upgrade their facilities, if at all possible. Another question is, what is the awareness level of these results on the tribal level? Are there chemicals that tribal members are concerned about that are not being tested for? Okay. Um, sorry, what was the first part of that question? I see it in the chat box. Yes. So what is awareness? Yeah. Yes, awareness level. Um, so I am not sure that um, as a whole, tribal utilities or their tribal members are receiving this type of data. Um, so you re I really had to dig to find this data. Um, they're just reporting their own individual um, tribal utility uh, public water system. Um, but the data is publicly available. Um, it's just a matter of how to communicate this back to the tribal community. Um, and are there chemicals that tribal members are concerned about? Um, yeah, so there's whole other, you know, hundreds of chemicals that um, are not yet being monitored um, as far as um, what they are. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the different classes. But the classes that are being monitored thus far, um, I would consider those the priority pollutants of this, these emerging classes. The next question is, is the work done only at the university level or is, it, or is there grassroots tribal participation in sampling and analysis? So, um, this work was actually done at the federal level by EPA, I should say the um, monitoring of it um, and the labs um, and quantifying the concentrations. But as looking at the data, I'm doing that. And, you know, there are other um, researchers looking at this data. Um, so it's done, I would say more at the federal level. Um, university labs, um, USGS, they will also analyze samples for these contaminants. So can grassroots organizations get their water sampled? Um, that can be a, um, a sensitive subject uh, simply because, um, you know, it, it's, we can't just go out and test tribal water. Okay, you need approvals um, to look at different contaminants and they have to be justified. Um, it's a matter of talking to many different invested parties, your utility, um, if your tribe has an environmental office or a water office, as well as tribal leadership. Um, in my own work, when I work with tribes, I always make sure to get tribal approval before testing for any chemical. Um, on top of it, uh, this analysis can be quite expensive. Um, if you're looking at a, the suite of hormones, um, that can be upwards of $1,000 per sample. Um, so it's best to work with your tribe if there is an issue or if, if, there is, if there are contaminants that you'd like to be analyzed. I have another question. Uh, what do you view as the barriers to getting additional tribal water system to participate in future UCMRs, how can they be overcome? So um, that uh, specific, um, you know, how EPA got tribes involved 
Um, I'm not sure of the precise steps that were taken um, for that. Now, um, for future UCMRs, I would obviously like to see more tribes um, involved. I know that for, if your tribal public water system is of a certain size, for in instance, large public water systems, EPA will ask the tribe to, for that analysis. Um, whereas smaller public water systems or resource limited tribes um, can have EPA pay for that analysis. Um, so it's a matter of communicating, um, EPA communicating to the tribe, inviting them. Um, I'm not, again, I'm unfamiliar with that process. As well as um, you may have to pay for that analysis. Okay, we're gonna administer a poll at this time um, regarding the webinar. So if you could answer that would be very appreciated. Meanwhile, we have another question uh, regarding um, the removal. So are there any proposed methods for removing pharmaceuticals from wastewater systems? Um, so there are many proposed methods, but on the wastewater side, none of these contaminants are regulated. So your wastewater systems are not going to, um, I guess, upgrade their treatment plant to remove them. Now, if you are using the wastewater for reclamation in the state of Arizona, you can um, produce different classes of uh, wastewater or wastewater biosolids, in which case the water, wastewater has to go through a tertiary treatment. Um, in many cases, that's additional oxidation. So UV, um, ozone, uh, and those will um, uh, treat some of these pharmaceuticals. Um, but it does not completely remove them. And again, they're just not regulated, so no one is intentionally trying to remove pharmaceuticals from wastewater. Okay, our next question is, uh, thank you for the great presentation. I'm curious about vanadium. Where is it coming from? And would, you, would be great to hear where you found the regulatory limits for vanadium. So EPA is setting the uh, health levels for these contaminants based off of toxicology data. Um, so that's something set by EPA. Now, as far as um, uh, uh, where it's coming from, um, many of these heavy metals are just naturally occurring. Um, and so they will uh, be weathered during uh, groundwater transport. Okay, another question and comment. Thank you for this informative talk. Regarding these unregulated contaminants, what was the EPA's goal to move forward on addressing these contaminants? Do they hope to identify which contaminants have been commonly found based on these four data sets? And will they then identify which ones need to be regulated? Or do they recognize that all of these contaminants are priority contaminants and hope to regulate all of them. And then why do some tribes choose to not test for certain contaminants? Okay, um, so as far as EPA's motivation, um, I'm guessing that um, you know, a lot of these chemicals are just popping up in water. We know that um, through other different programs, um, you know, TOSCA, Superfund, um, that these chemicals are of concern um, and they're likely going to show up in drinking water. Um, so that's what I believe their motivation is. And in order to get them regulated, we really do need to see um, what is the frequency and concentrations nationwide. Um, so I, I believe that to be the motivation. Um, so that eventually they will get regulated. Um, and what are the implications if they get regulated? Um, that may require uh, drinking water upgrades. Um, it'll definitely involve informing the public of what these chemicals are and uh, why are they in the water, at what concentrations should we be concerned. Um, why do some tribes choose not to test for certain contaminants? That I'm not sure. Um, it could come down to cost or maybe it's just not a class of contaminants that uh, they're concerned about or maybe there's just low risk. 
Um, for example, um, if you're a tribe located near Phoenix, you're going to have a lot of wastewater impact. And so I would suggest that they test for hormones. Whereas if it's a tribe that um, is impacted by a lot of fresh water, I don't really see a reason to test for those classes of chemicals. The report back to tribe is critical given the adverse health effects associated with some of these chemicals. And the fact that many of the levels are above EPA standards, are there any of these systems considered Superfund sites? So um, for this uh, survey, they only analyzed uh, drinking water. Um, it's as far as I'm concerned, um, some of the um, drinking water that's polluted, um, maybe with Superfund contaminants like uranium, um, you know, that, that, I guess, intersection is rare. Um, I don't know that there are many public water systems considered Superfund sites. But it is likely that Superfund sites can impact the public water systems. Another question, the Gila, Salt, and Little Colorado Rivers have very low flow. I can walk across them. Would this lead to concentrated levels of contaminants? Um, that I am unsure of. Um, my, I would uh, imagine that um, if there is evaporation, then yes. Um, the... Santa Cruz River um, has very low flow, but it's all wastewater. Um, so it depends on what is, I guess, feeding into these rivers, um, infiltration rates, as well as evaporation. Okay, um, another comment was, uh, thanks for a great presentation. From the environmental justice perspective, do you have a sense of how the distributions of emerging contaminants compare between tribal and settler water systems? So I uh, did not assess the non-tribal public water systems because that data set was enormous. Um, there were um, thousands and thousands of uh, different public water systems analyzing for um, you know, 30 contaminants. So there's a lot of data points. I didn't have the time to go uh, through that. Um, but previous work has shown that these smaller uh, drinking water systems compared to larger drinking water systems um, can be more polluted. Um, our, my previous paper did show that um, comparing tribal public water systems, non-tribal under the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, you know, the tribal water systems had poorer water quality. So I would imagine for emerging contaminants, um, the story will be the same. Okay, um, I found it interesting in the poll that 67% of the attendees that this webinar was very relevant to the work that they do. Uh, one last question that I will ask uh, before concluding the seminar is that, what are the ways to naturally remove these contaminants rather than use bioremediation that could impact cultural sites? Excuse me. Um, so to naturally remove these contaminants, um, you know, the um, thinking natural versus engineered, it's all kind of engineered. Um, the uh, soil itself is a good filter. Um, there are um, you know, minerals, there is organic matter that can uh, extract these out of the liquid phase. Um, that's, uh, that can be referred to as the uh, soil aquifer treatment. Um, many of these chemicals um, are photoreactive, so light itself can um, uh, break down the organics over time. Um, but uh, I guess we tend to go to the engineered systems to uh, treat these chemicals um, because they are persistent. Um, 
it may require more rigorous uh, water treatment. So as far as ways to naturally remove, um, you know, we can use um, natural um, processes like phytoremediation. Um, we can look at uh, different plants to sorb the chemicals. Um, or we can, uh, you know, let the uh, water, polluted water, um, you know, infiltrate into the ground and hopefully the contaminants get removed in that process. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Otak, for your presentation and for answering these questions. We had a great number of uh, uh, questions in the chat box and a great dialogue. And so um, I would like to conclude this seminar and thank you so much for everyone who joined the webinar series for Water in the Native World, which uh, featured the six papers uh, in, in the special issue. I encourage you to visit ucower.org at the link that was in the chat box to download any of the papers in the special issue, as well as if you're interested in seeing any of the papers uh, previously recorded, they're available at the website if you miss one of the webinars. We received uh, great interest in this webinar series in general. Um, and we are considering uh, continuing this webinar series in the fall semester featuring papers outside of this special issue. I was made aware of other uh, uh, research articles by other similar um, researchers focusing on indigenous uh, communities and water challenges. So look out for that announcement. And thank you so much again for joining this webinar series. Have an excellent day.